Now the first thing I have to do, because I told him I would, thank you for the kind words, checks in the mail. <laughs> We're thankful for everybody here this afternoon. Uh, hopefully this won't go into the evening too late anyway. Uh, you know, this has been a good study so far. And I appreciate all the other speakers. You know, there are several objectives when we study from the James chapter 1. Uh, I was just talking to Nathan back there. We were talking about James, what a practical book it was. I said, yeah, it's so practical. There's a lot of these denominational preachers like to tear it out of their Bible. But anyway, we, you know, we've already had some good lessons so far dealing with some of these points. And by, by way of remembrance, because I know I'm dealing with some elderly people here, myself included, uh, we'll just kind of recap. Where have we been so far? Well, first, we had that first lesson, a good lesson by Brother Gomez. That was a really good lesson. I appreciate that, too. That we need to appreciate the value of the trials that we endure in this life. They do have value. And he explained that very well. Then we had a lesson to understand how sin develops from temptation to death, meaning a separation of God by error. And we appreciate that. that was a good lesson too. Actually, they've all been good. I can, repeating myself. Good in the sense that it was a good lesson, David. Not, never mind. <laughs> Brother David Brown, of course, uh, showed us that God is not the source of temptation, but only good. And he went into the, uh, that description of good very deeply, and I appreciate that. Only good comes from God. All good originates with God. Thus, men cannot blame God for their sins. And if you stick with us after me, if I don't put you to sleep and uh, send you home because you're bored to death, John West is going to come up after me, and he's going to speak about uh, being a practitioner of uh, religion, contrasting the difference between Religion that is useless and that which is pure and undefiled for God. My duty, outside of keeping you awake, is based on James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, in which we read of the importance of receiving the engrafted word. Not only receiving the word, but to also be doers of the word and not hearers only. And this is a theme that will be repeated throughout James' letter which we'll cover in, the, I guess, the next two lectures. But read with me James chapter 1, 21 through 25, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Again, I was reading from the King James Version. We'll come back later and discuss some of that, uh, how it's rendered in the ASV. But for our uh, readers of the King James Bible, I know many of you do use the King James, myself included, I want to circle back quickly and look at the phrase, a superfluity of naughtiness. Uh, in verse 21 before we continue forward. Uh, superfluity is really not a common word. It's not used in our everyday English language. Anybody here ever use the word superfluity? Okay, anyway. The Greek word is used only three other times in the New Testament. Once in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 17, and twice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, and chapter 10, verse 15. Strong's Greek Dictionary defines it as a surplusage, a superabundance, or an abundance. In fact, the other three times that it's used, it's translated as abundance. 
And there seems to be no need to departing from this meaning, uh, this uh, meaning at this particular time in this verse. But as a side note, Thayer's dictionary also includes residue, remains, such as the wickedness remaining over in a Christian from his state prior to conversion which could also fit here. So keeping that in mind, we just want to keep with that in mind what that means, but regarding the word naughtiness, uh, in our current English usage, the way it's used today, naughtiness has kind of acquired a uh, somewhat petty sense in popular usage, such as the uh, mischievous pranks of children, you know, Christmas time, you know, you're naughty or you're nice, you know, those sort of things. But that definition renders it out of the question here. Thayer's definition of the Greek word naughtiness used in verse 21 is malice, ill will, wickedness, depravity, and evil. Thus the phrase superfluity of naughtiness simply means an abundance of wickedness. Or as the ASV says, an overflowing of wickedness. So moving forward, uh, there are several observations I said earlier that can be made in the Word of God, not only from chapter 1, but through these verses, verses 21 through 25. But to start with, I want to go with this as it relates to the Word, what the Word is able to do in our lives. So the first thing we're going to consider, consider here is the power of the Word of God, the power of Notice the words of James himself. He says regarding God's word, it is that which is able to save your souls, verse 21. Stated very clearly, the word of God has the power to save our souls. Let's think about that for a minute. Because this is something that's important to both the New Testament Christians as defined in the Bible as well as those who have not obeyed the gospel. Meaning something that Christians with sin in their life certainly need to keep in mind, as well as those in the world who are living a life of sin. What is it that we're saving? What is our soul? According to the definition found in Thayer's Dictionary, quote, the soul is an essence which differs from the body and is not dissolved by death, distinguished from other parts of the body. It is the seat of our feelings, our desires, our affections and aversions, meaning our loves and our hates, our heart. The human soul, insofar as it is constituted, that by the right use of the aids offered by God, it can attain its highest end and secure eternal blessedness. The soul is regarded as a moral being designed for everlasting life, unquote. You know, uh, David back there once explained to me, your soul is the real you that God sees and not necessarily the one that you show to everybody else. I guess that's another good way of putting it, Brother Brown. But did you catch that last part of Thayer's definition? It's important to both Christians and non-Christians equally. Your soul is designed for everlasting life. Where it will spend everlasting life is determined by how or if you use the aids offered by God. For us living today, that means the word of God that we have in our Bibles. That Bible you're holding in your hand holds that which is able to save your soul if you use it correctly. Note that Thayer said the right use of the aids offered by God. I found that interesting when I read that definition because it implies that there is a, such a thing as the wrong use. Bruce, wake up. The wrong use of God's word. I'm just teasing you. And that's a message we need to stress with our denominational friends. Because they sit in services, and I'm not going to call it worship, but they sit in services and the word is abused 
to teach them error. We need to explain to them that there's a right and wrong use of God's word. So with the right use of God's word, our soul can attain its highest end and secure eternal blessedness, meaning an eternal life in heaven with God our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. To those that falsely use the Word of God or ignore it altogether, in contrast to that eternal blessedness we're talking about, their soul, designed for everlasting life, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, verse 46, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 and other passages. To see how God's word is able to save our soul, let's consider another scripture. Its power to save is in its ability to create anew. That is to cause us to be born again. The Apostle Peter wrote of this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, affirming that when we obey the truth, we are, quote, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, end quote. This is because of what the word of God contains. God's way of salvation through Christ. As Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, to everybody. Likewise, the Word of God has the power to sanctify. You know, you start going through the Bible and figuring out what all the power of God's uh, Word has the power to do. It's amazing. I just got a short list here. It has the power to sanctify. The word sanctify means to set apart for a holy purpose. Jesus in His prayer in John 17 spoke of the sanctifying influence of God's Word and saying in verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, Thy word is truth. Thus the word of God can serve to set us apart for God's own purpose. Also the word of God can preserve, it can sustain, it can protect us. The Ephesian elders were admonished to keep the church pure by feeding their flock this very same word. All the counsel of God. All of it in Acts chapter 20, verses 27 through 32. When we take the time to consider the power of God's word, it becomes evident that this, his word is very important to the Christian, just as James was writing to, as well to all of mankind. But the value of the engrafted word can only be realized when certain conditions are met. We find some of those conditions mentioned in our text so we can, that we can benefit from the powerful word of God. It begins with, there are things that we must set aside. James mentioned such things, saying, Lay apart all filthiness and abundance of wickedness, as we just mentioned earlier. But Paul gives a, a, a descriptive list of such things that we are to lay aside in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Not a comprehensive list, but a, a good list there, just to give you an idea. There he wrote, Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, Uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake cometh the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. Wherein ye also once walked when ye lived in these things, but now do ye also put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, railing, Shameful speaking out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, 
seeing that you have put off the old man with his doings. There are things that as a New Testament Christian, we must lay aside. If we want the word of God to work in us, as we just read that powerful word of God, we must lay these things aside. So for the word of God to bear its fruit in our lives, so they, you might want to call them the weeds of sin here, they, they must first be removed. We cannot hope to benefit from the study of God's word if we continue to dwell on that which is spiritually filthy and to engage in wickedness. It's going to be very hard. And this may be why some don't get much out of their Bible study. They just simply do not want to lay aside the sinful things in their life. But also, another condition that we have listed there in verse 21 is that we must have a proper attitude. James says that we are to receive with meekness the Word of God. According to Strong's Greek Dictionary, the word translated as meekness is defined as mildness, that is, by implication, humility or meekness. Thayer's definition is mildness of disposition, gentleness of uh, spirit, uh, meekness. Humility is probably the one we're most familiar with. Therefore, an humble and receptive attitude is essential to get the most out of God's word. Twice more in this letter, James will encourage an attitude of meekness to humble ourselves. In James 4, 6, he says, God resisteth the proud, but give grace unto the humble. In verse 10 of that same chapter, he writes, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You know, when you're first becoming a Christian, when you finally decide to take that step and become a New Testament Christian, you just have to humble yourself. You have to. But how do you remain humble? It helps to remain humble if we remember two things. First, we too were once sinners, just like everybody else, and in need of God's salvation according to his word. And second, we also can be deceived if we don't study to learn and obey God's truth to save ourselves, Acts 2.40. So it just comes out of this question, is the prayer of King David our own? In Psalm 119.8, he prayed, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Is that our prayer? As a result of these things, the word must be engrafted in our hearts. Still in verse 21. Engrafted or implanted, depending on your version of the Bible, either way is only the engrafted word which can truly save your souls. Therefore, we must make sure, be sure to take the words of the pages and then plant them on our heart. As Solomon said, speaking of God's law and his commandments in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, and again in chapter 7, verse 3, quote, write them upon the tablet of thy heart, end quote. Otherwise, we're no different from the Jews who gave service to their old covenant word written on stone and scrolls. In fact, it's a distinguishing feature of those under the new covenant that's found in the New Testament is that the word of God is to be written in our hearts. Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 13. In that passage, which is looking back actually to a prophecy that was made in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 33. But in Hebrews, it's written this. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, 
because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Hebrews 8, verses 8 and 10. 8 through 10. So I ask you today, where is the word of God? Is it only in the ink inscribed on the pages of your Bible? Or have we read it often enough? Meditated it on enough? That it has become engrafted and planted in our heart as well. That's the way God would have it done. Is it that even possible without daily or at least regular reading of the Bible? You know, we often encourage, as we note of the board here, I think we, we keep track of it. We encourage people to read their Bible daily. But a, steeper, a deeper study of God's New Testament law really should be our goal. Don't just read it. Study it. Work to move God's holy word from the inked pages of your Bible and write them on the tablet of your heart. Yet hearing or even learning God's word alone does no good by itself. Uh, there are atheists that can almost quote the Bible to you. Does them no good, does it? It must be applied to our lives. Verses 22 through 24. You know, we must be doers of the words and not hearer only. Otherwise, we deceive ourselves. And usually only ourselves. For certain, God is not deceived. Because Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Nor is the devil. He's not deceived. He knows his own. As Bruce was saying earlier, he knows who to go after. We are told to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Most likely, our children receive right through us. They see how we live and how we act, as will many others. In James 1.22, we are told to be doers of the word and not hearers only. To be hearers only is to deceive or to delude ourselves. To prove this point, James uses the example of a man observing himself in a mirror in verses 23 through 24. You might think of this as a man who is looking into God's Word. He's got his Bible here and he's looking at it. And that kind of acts as a mirror to his soul. Looking into the word and not obeying it is like a man that looks into a natural mirror and doing nothing about what he sees. You know, he's got a big old glob of grease on his face and just goes off and does nothing about it. This is the man who glances at himself in the mirror, but he went away and he stayed away, and I'll say more of that in a moment. Therefore, he straightway or immediately forgets what he saw, forgets and neglects what manner of man he is. However, God doesn't forget, Luke 12, verse 6. Man, however, neglects, so he forgets. Forgets what he saw, it kind of just escapes his attention. And as a reminder, we want to call to mind the emphasis and the responsibility that's placed on the hearer of the word. He is told to not be a hearer only. He has some responsibility. Don't think that the one who hears the word has no responsibility and that's, uh, that it's only the teacher, the preacher, the guy he's studying with that's their responsibility. No. The soil has a great responsibility if the seed is to sprout and grow. So let me be very frank about verses 23 and 24. And this idea of looking into the glass or the mirror. 
the person that hears what God says about their life and the way they live and the things they say and the things they do, and it identifies their problems, their sin, but then they walk out the door making no changes, forgetting the flaws, the sin in their life. That's the person under consideration here. And I think this is a problem for non-Christians. You know, we've all had visitors. They come here, sit down one time, listen to a good sermon, get up and walk out the door, and you never see them. <laughs> That's it. But frankly, there are some New Testament Christians as well. We come to worship. We hear what we need to hear. The Word of God exposes the way we're living our life. And we are made aware of the flaws, the, the sin in our life while we're sitting in that pew after listening to that sermon. We sing the invitation song. Then the closing song. Then we have the closing prayer. But rather than acknowledging our sin and fixing our flaws, we walk out the door forgetting what God convicted in our hearts with a message that was supposed to spur us to repent and change our lives. So don't think this is only on the non-Christian. This happens to Christians too. What good is it to hear the word of God and not do it? Do not be deceived. Merely hearing the word of God is not salvation. Which brings us to verse 25, which tells us the perfect law blesses the man who is a doer. Let's read that verse again. And since I read it from the King James at the beginning, I'll read from the American Standard Version this time. It says, But he that looketh into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and so continueth, being not a hearer that forgetteth, but a doer that worketh, this man shall be blessed in his doing. You know, this verse opens with a very simple three-letter word, but, making it evident that a contrast is being made, and in this case, it's between the hearer only that forgets and the doer of the word. It is essential that we and those we study with you folks that like to do Bible studies, that we and the people we study with take a very good, thorough look into the law that is described to us in our Bibles as perfect and receive the word with all readiness of mind, Acts 17, verse 11. And I say this because many denominations around us teach all grace and no law. A concept that's completely foreign to the word of truth, the perfect law, that we hold in our hands. The Greek translated as perfect means complete, whole. A fact that should be important to us be, means that we have the complete, the whole law of liberty in our hands. The definition of the Greek word translated as liberty is our English word, freedom. And those who have obeyed the law of Christ are now free from sin, its bondage, and its eternal cost. Paul wrote in Galatians 5, verse 1, Stand there fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. After writing so clearly about looking into a law that is complete and whole, and one that is a law of liberty in which man finds his freedom from the bondage of sin by his compliance to his instructions, James then states a condition, as God often does when making promises. He says, and so continueth. Another word we need to understand. To carry on with the frank example I made in verses 23 and 24, here in verse 25, we see by contrast the non-Christian I'm going to apply this. I know James is writing to New Testament Christians. Let's do this contrast between the non-Christian with a good and honest heart. Or even the New Testament Christian who keeps on looking and doing. 
both men look into the mirror, they see a flaw, the sin, and they fix the problem. That's the man with the good and honest heart, and that's a faithful Christian. He returns to the mirror, sees another flaw, and goes and fixes that problem. James is picturing a person here who keeps looking over and over again into God's perfect, complete law of liberty. Both men, if they continue in God's word, will be changed, made anew. One to become a new creature in Christ. The other striving to be the best, faithful, obedient New, Test new Testament Christian he can be. A dedicated worker in the Lord's vineyard. That's what happens when you continually look into the law, see the issue in the mirror, see the sin, and fix it. Hopefully, the non-Christian will become made anew in a New Testament Christian. The other Christian, if he continues to do that throughout his life, we know his reward. The faithful Christian is always studying. He's always examining. He's always fixing. This is the one James says is blessed in his deeds, blessed in his doing. This is the man who looks into the perfect law of liberty and stays close to it. He continues looking. He accepts and it stands for the law, meaning he continues in the law as a doer of the law, not just a hearer. He continues therein and is not moved away from the hope of the gospel. He's not carried away with strange doctrines, but is established in the faith, stands fast in it, abides by it, and he continues looking into this glass and looks to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of his faith, Hebrews 12, 2. He's not a forgetful hearer but takes heed to the things he hears and the things he sees in the word, lest he should let them slip. And being conscious of the weakness of his memory, I know I'm one of those, makes an effort to remember and to bring to mind what he has heard and the knowledge that he's gained from the word of God so he can do it. And notice it's not just by looking into the law of liberty alone, but by continuing in it and being a doer of the work. Doing what work? The work that's defined in the complete, perfect law of liberty. The work of faith in a labor of love of patience and hope in every work and ordinance given in the gospel of Christ, the New Testament, doing and being subject to all of it. All of it in faith and obedience with a view looking to eternity and being in the presence of the glory of the Father and His Son. I think Paul summed it up best in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Notice again that the true blessing comes not by looking into the perfect law of liberty alone, but by continuing in it and being a doer of the work. That man shall be blessed in his deed. So it's not just reading of the word which provides salvation, but the actual continual, continuing application of the word through faithful obedience and continuing to look in that mirror and when you see a problem, fix it. So what we learned today. Notice again what that, uh, James calls the powerful word of God, the perfect law of liberty in verse 25. This is because it has the power to create anew, to sanctify, to preserve, to sustain, and protect the New Testament Christian. God's word provides true freedom, liberation from the guilt and the dominion of sin. 
Of course, what gives the word its power is the message it contains, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's power unto salvation is Romans 1 16. And certainly at some point, every one of you have heard God's word, the gospel of Christ. If not, come and see me afterwards after we finish up today. But understand that hearing is not enough. You must receive the message of the gospel with meek, meekness. In other words, believe the gospel, John 3, 16. You must lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. That is, to repent of your sin, Acts 2, 38, 17, and verse 30 and 31. Of course, we must confess to Jesus as the Son of God as Lord, Acts 8, 37, Romans 10, 10. And you must be a doer of the word. And that includes obeying his command to be baptized for the remission of sins, not to join some organization. For Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. Jesus calls us to be baptized, Mark 16, 16, Matthew 28, 19, Acts 2, 38, 22, 16. But once you do that, I must remain faithful unto death and you will receive a crown of life. That means you're going to do this by continuing to look into the perfect law of liberty, by, by making corrections where are needed and removing any sin that you have in your life, being a doer of law, not just a hearer, by living a life of faithful service in Christ, Revelation 2.10. Receive with meekness these very words of Jesus and his apostles. Engraft his word, write it on your heart, take it off the pages of your Bible, and write it on your heart. Obey the gospel, be a doer of the work, for that is how the word of God is able to save your eternal soul. Thank you for your time and attention. Wake up.